Welcome everyone to the latest webinar with Gotham Plastic Surgery. We are here today with Dr. Philip Miller to talk all about revision surgery. And most importantly, why getting your first surgery with someone like Dr. Miller is important. So whether you're considering surgery or you've had surgery and you're unhappy and you're thinking about a revision, hopefully we can educate you today and provide you with a lot of answers to your questions. So I, we've been doing these webinars for a while and I always introduce Dr. Miller and today he said I needed to cut back and not talk about so much about how he's awesome. So I will just tell you guys, he is amazing. Double board certified facial plastic surgeon, you know, on all the media, on all the academic, you know, publications and lecturing, but I won't go into it in too many details that you're uh, welcome to visit the website to kind of see all the great things that Dr. Miller has done. Um, but I do just want to make sure that you all know that his flagship practice is in New York City at called Gotham Plastic Surgery, and he also sees patients in New Orleans. So, which is, I think we started that, what, about two, three years ago? Uh, well, we started it in, around three and a half years ago. Ah, before COVID, I guess. Oh, uh, well, no, we started talking about it. We started talking okay. about it, I think, in like February of 2020, right. and we didn't do it until maybe six months later. Got it. All right. So anyway, so anyone who is in the South, you are welcome to see Dr. Miller there. But most importantly, many of our patients come from out of town, not even out of the city or out of the state, but even out of the country. So you do not need to be local to have Dr. Miller's expertise. We have, we've been doing virtual consultations since before it was a thing, Dr. Miller likes to say. So um, without further ado, Dr. Miller will get started. Um, any questions you may have, feel free to pop them into the chat. I'll be here to help take care of you and stay till the end or we'll do our giveaway. So take it away, Dr. Miller. All right, thanks. So let's make sure that I uh, share this appropriately. Again, everyone, thank you very much for coming. Again, thank my staff for organizing this. Uh, April uh, and Tanya, Zane, Clay, Padina, Carmen, Jose, I, uh, Zane, I, I'm probably have missed someone, but thank you all so very much uh, for putting this all together. And I'm very grateful. And of course, Risa, for you hosting. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming back. If you've been here before, and for those of you who are new, please know this is not only live, but we will entertain questions towards the end. And we really welcome your questions. This is a very interesting and unique topic, because here we are talking about revision surgery. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and pop up. Uh, Risa, let me know whether or not I've done it properly. I have to go ahead and click some I'm proper here. things here before I do that. Go, it should work. We're all set. Perfect. Okay, great. So, uh, gee, this is odd. I mean, you would think we're going to have a webinar on facial plastic surgery, and here I am talking about revision. And is revision surgery a bad thing? Well, not necessarily. I mean, we're as we'll see. There are certain individuals who have had plastic surgery and now need it a second time years later because there are certain procedures which won't last. And you will have, for example, facelifts or neck lifts that will last around 10 to 15 years, and then you'll need it again. From a surgeon's perspective, we still call those revision facelifts, right? Um, if you need to have surgery done because you are uh, um, uh, sort of seeing the ages, seeing the, the effects of age on you, then having a secondary procedure is still called in our hands, revision surgery. It still requires the same techniques. So not all revision surgery is bad, just so that you know. The other thing you should know though, is revision surgery is a totally different can of worms. It is a different operation. A revision rhinoplasty is not the same thing as a primary rhinoplasty. And by that, I mean that not all surgeons do revision work. And it's important for you to know that. So it's one thing if you want to get X procedure, it's very different than if you want to get revision X procedure. Again, not all surgeons do revision surgeries that they perform on primary. For example, I don't do breast surgery, but doing breast revision surgery, again, is not the same thing as doing original surgery. So the first question we have to ask ourselves right off the bat is, you know, why do patients want a revision? Well, keep in mind, guess what? It's not just a patient that wants revision surgery. Sometimes the surgeon wants it as well. The surgeon's looking at it, looking at the, the results and saying, you know what, this isn't on par with what I normally expect of my work, 
And often you'll find as patients that the surgeon can agree with you. So if you as a patient are unhappy with your results, go back, I encourage you, go back to your original physician because they don't want you walking around unhappy. They don't want that result, which they may deem to be less than satisfactory or less reflective of their own work. They don't want that. Uh, uh, they don't want you being unhappy. They don't want that result walking around in the community. So please go back to your surgeon and convey to them that you're unhappy. And you may find that the surgeon feels the exact same way. Um, I find that some patients are or sort of almost need to get angry um, when they do come in to see me in order to justify that they um, are disappointed with their results rather than just coming in and saying to me, you know what, Dr. Miller, I love the results. I think it's great, but uh, it didn't meet my expectation. Instead, they have to sort of, in order to really get the courage to speak to me, they have to sort of get angry at me at first. And when I immediately tell them, yeah, you're right, you know what, that didn't meet my expectations, it completely, completely just diffuses the situation. They feel calm, they feel relaxed. Uh, they, they know that I'm their partner, as I promised I always would be, that I'm on their side, that I want the best for them. And we can engage in a conversation that can give them the results that they want. So it's not just my practice. I think anyone, any practice that you've been getting your surgery from, if you're unhappy with, go back to them, speak to them, and, and, and see how probably receptive they are. Now, why do, why do we tend to need revision surgery in the first place? In the first place. Well, as I mentioned, I, I do a fair amount of revision surgery, but not, they're not my own cases. They're, 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 they are more often than not um, uh, pa patients who have been at other, in, other locations, had surgery elsewhere, they've been frustrated with the progress with their other physician, and then they come to me. And I think what I've gleaned over all these years, the, the main reason why patients, I think, have been unhappy with their original surgery is that communication failure at their very initial consultation. That if you ask them, they will almost always say, you know, I spoke and the surgeon didn't hear. I wanted this and the surgeon seemed not to listen. Um, I conveyed this, but the surgeon wanted that. And so it's that miscommunication of anticipations, miscommunication of expectations that I think sets you up even before the surgery begins with an unsatisfactory result, which will necessitate a revision surgery. So it's really important from the very beginning. In fact, just today, I was doing a case and a patient was nervous and she, she, she wanted to go over uh, a critical part of an analysis, which is her uh, anticipated after results, which we're gonna go over a little bit later in this conversation. And uh, she wanted to go over them, we went over them and, and she didn't feel as if there was an adequate time. And, and she asked me to come back into the room before we walked back. And, and the first thing I said to her was, listen, don't rush. If you wanna take more time considering what the results are that you want, Go, by all means, postpone the surgery. Let's not rush into this. Do not at all think I'm forcing you into this. Let's communicate. Let's make sure we're both on the same page. If we don't know what that unified vision is, if we don't know what we both want, and it's the same result out of this maneuver, out of this technique, out of this procedure, then we're doomed to have one of us be disappointed and it's going to most likely be you. And I don't want that to be the case. Let's postpone if we have. Needless to say, she didn't postpone, we did the surgery, she looks terrific and she's very happy, but can't impress upon you enough, communication is so important in the very, very beginning with your surgeon, you need to feel that they hear you, you trust them, and that they um, uh, have communicated properly, that they hear your vision and that they can uh, achieve that. Um, uh, and then there's something that's completely out of the surgeon's hand and something out of the patient's hands. And I always sort of say, look, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. You can't control your healing. I can't control your healing either. So think about it. We're in the operating room. We get a result. We're watching. We're looking exactly what we do. You would think that, that any surgeon is looking at the results that they are actually getting. And yes, you can see the results on the table. And, and I mean, common sense sort of says you, you're not going to want to stop the operation until you get the results the patient wants. That just sort of makes common sense. And that is typically what happens. 
But then you bandage the patient all up and they go on their way. And at that point, I don't have control, the patient doesn't have control, and the healing process takes over. And a lot of times that there's just unfavorable healing that results in lumps or bumps or irregularities or distortions or, or an, unanticipated uh, rips or tears uh, uh, underneath the skin or, or, or a result of bruising, a whole host of things that occurs uh, not within that confined anywhere from 45 minutes to eight hour operation, but from the eight hours, eight days, eight weeks, eight months after the surgery that we have no control over. So, so unfavorable healing in the intra in the post-operative period. Um, and here's where I will blame myself as well as my colleagues and where we can be um, uh, sort of accountable. And that is ina inadequate intraoperative assessment. I, I just sort of said, you gotta, you know, it, it just makes sense that I'm not gonna let you leave the operating room without looking your best. And I think that some problems can occur not from unfavorable healing or poor communication, but because something was missed on the operating room table. There was, it didn't look great. And either there was an anticipation that it was gonna heal just fine, or it was missed. And one way I go about that as a Dina, who's my amazing scrub tech will tell you, is I, I really enlist everyone in the room from Carmen, the, um, uh, my circulator to Adina, my scrub tech, to um, my fellow who is with me sometimes observing and the anesthesiologist or anyone else who might be in the room at the time, credentialed of course, um, and they're watching, observing. Uh, I want them to say, hey, you know, hey, did you see that pleat? Did you see that curvature? Did you see that? Because sometimes things can just get missed. And it's in the operating room, if it doesn't look great, I always say it's gotta look perfect at the end of the operation. And if it doesn't, don't expect it to miraculously get better afterwards for the most part. Um, and the final thing is, and again, I put this onus uh, on myself or as the surgeon. And when I say myself, I mean other surgeons, unrealistic expectations from the patient's desires. And I put that onus on me because it's up to me to know that that patient has unrealistic expectations and is a setup for unhappy results requiring ultimate revision surgery. I should know that at the initial consultation. I should be able to see that at the initial consultation and, and, and doing virtual imaging is so key and important in, in assessing that so that we can communicate what our anticipated result is. Uh, you know, there's around 5% of patients I see, well, maybe closer to 3% who can tell me exactly what it is that they don't like, but they can't tell me what they like. So they know exactly what they hate about what they're currently looking in the mirror, but they don't know whenever I show them a whole bunch of solutions, nothing makes them happy. That's not a patient that is ready to have surgery. So the unexpected or unrealistic expectations are on the patient's side. And I think you'll find that there are some surgeons who, and it's not often, and you know, I really, and I'm, I really don't put myself in this category because I think I'm very, have very good self-awareness, but there are some surgeons who I think get themselves uh, sort of over their head in, in, in procedures and they have uh, unrealistic expectations of what they can actually achieve on particular cases. So being very honest here, as I think you'll, uh, those of you who know my practice and know me, we're honest with you. We tell you the truth. And these are the real reasons why you'll find, for the most part, revision rhino, revision cases are necessary. So what are the criteria for undergoing revision? Again, without question, proper expectations, proper communication about what it is that you want to achieve. It's the appropriate time. I wrote here around one year, but that's not by any means a definite. There are plenty of times when going in sooner than that is indicated. For example, let's say, oh, I don't know, um, I, I did a, a rhinoplasty and um, I, you know, I was pretty sure that I took the bump down. I looked, I saw it, I felt that everything looked great. And as the patient starts healing, there's just a small little bump that remains left. There's no reason to wait a full year for that. You can go in earlier and, and shave that bump down. Um, uh, uh, we, we're, I, we do a, a, a facelift and, um, and all of a sudden some of the sutures that were put in, they don't, they're not working and, 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 and they're not providing the lift that I wanted to. Again, there's no reason to wait 
for that, you can go back in sooner and, and resuspend them. That could be due from a number of things from the skin stretching after it's been lifted to, to the skin or the, uh, the uh, tissue tearing underneath. So, so there's no reason, but, but by the same token, um, there are advantages to waiting a year. And so if you hear that the surgeon is not necessarily just delaying, is they're, they're not necessarily brushing you off. They're doing what they think is in your best interest by just delaying the surgery until you're more mature or the scar is more mature than so the result of being more mature, not you, but the result being more mature so that they can get a better assessment on what the issue is and what needs to be done. And I think it's also beneficial if you're going to another surgeon to make sure that you have a thorough history of what you had done elsewhere. And all you need to do really is bring your operative notes. The operative notes are dictated notes by the surgeon right after they perform the operation. They are your notes. They're not the surgeons. They're your notes. And you just have to call the office and request them and then provide them to the surgeon who you are requesting the revision. Let's go over some reasons why you might want to undergo revision rhinoplasty. Let's say there's improper healing. Uh, there's asymmetry that uh, may grow back or there may be some functional problems like valve collapse or obstruction of the airways or there's excessive scar tissue along the bridge of the nose. Maybe the bones themselves have changed due to aging or just quite frankly, the patient did not meet their expectations and they're just not happy with the results. Those are all reasons that patients or reasons why I see patients who are coming in for revision rhinoplasty. What about face and neck lift? But, you know, keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, not all revision face and neck lift is due to something being gone, uh, something gone wrong. Um, the patient coming in 10 years later, um, that they just aged. Uh, I tell my patients all the time, my facelifts will last forever as long as you don't smile, eat, chew, talk, laugh, fall, hit your face uh, by accident, um, you know, pull, pull your face with your hands, sneeze, blow your nose. You get the idea, you know, the moment we are out of the surgery, we continue to age, we continue to live. And, and that's putting forces that are completely against the very, very surgery that we just did. And so having uh, revision facelift or neck lift surgery 10, 15 years later is totally appropriate. No one would, no one would, would, would consider that to be uh, unexpected, but it's still within our perspective, it's still a revision work. Um, the number two reason I would say that I see revision facelift and neck uh, lift work is that the prior procedure that the individual had was too limited. And I'm going to be honest here, that's typically the patient's fault, not the surgeon's. More often than not, the patients are like, I'm not ready for a facelift. I'm not ready for a neck lift. Uh, all I want to do is, you know, this. And they go for a limited neck lift or a limited facelift or a limited procedure, and it doesn't meet their expectations. And, you know, you could argue that the surgeon should never have done that in the first place. By the same token, uh, I think surgeons try to make the patients happy and accommodate their wishes, not only in terms of their results, but also in terms of their fears about undergoing anesthesia or having too much uh, surgery done or not wanting to look too different or having a fast recovery period. So if the prior procedure was maybe too limited, that's another reason why you're going to see revision facelift and neck lift. And then a new one that's really becoming much more popular now is that the submandibular gland, which is located sort of in and around our jawline, that is, um, it wasn't either treated during the first surgery or as, it, as we age, it sort of drops or it gets larger or it becomes more obvious and prominent. And um, we're gonna go, I'm gonna show you real quick what I mean by that submandibular gland treatment. Ear to hear. Well, it's a technique called a deep neck lift. This is very different than the old fashioned neck lifts, which were more superficial in nature. A little liposuction didn't get the underlying deep fat. This neck lift now not only separates the first layer of muscle to remove the deeper fat tissue, okay, but it also takes those muscles and repositions them and tacks them up and lifts them in order to create a really nice jawline. But there's something else. There's something that this patient doesn't have that they had before and that's their submandibular gland. Now the gland itself sits often tucked up underneath the jawline, but as we get older, it sort of falls down. They even might even get a little big. And now when you do this, and you know, when we used to do the old fashioned neck lifts, it looked good, but they had a bulge right over here and a bulge right over here. And that bulge was the submandibular gland. Now, 
Now we take those out as part of the deep neck lift. It's okay, you have other glands in your face and in your mouth that produce saliva, so you don't necessarily need it. And not everybody does this operation because there are some nerves and some vessels that are nearby that have to be gingerly and carefully sort of pushed away as you take the gland out. But it is making necks now look terrific, absolutely great. So I hope this explains to you what a new deep neck lift is, how to get it, and the kind of results that you can get. Now, um, revision work is seen in every type of procedure that we do. And one way that we can assure that we don't have a patient go back for revision work is, for example, in a neck lift procedure, we, we, we lift the neck and we do a number of different techniques. We, we, we lift it at 20 degrees, we lift it at 25 degrees, at 30 degrees, we use different forces. We try to get the very best result possible. We don't just go in there and blindly execute our techniques without, as I mentioned previously, assessing how we're doing right there on the operating room table. Here's another example related to chin implants about making that assessment intraoperatively. We're putting in a chin implant today, and even though we did the virtual imaging pre-op and assessed that the patient would do best with a medium, sometimes that doesn't translate virtually into reality. And so what I do is I put in sizers, and here's what it looks like. This is a medium-sized implant that's a sizer. And that, that looks just about, that looks just about what I wanted to actually have him look like. But just to be sure, I'm gonna remove this and put in a large. Okay, now this is a large, right. and I actually like the way this looks too but it seems like it's a little too much. It's a little too more than what we were talking about. And I, I, I like the medium, I like the medium better. I'm gonna go ahead and put in a medium. Let's have a medium implant. So uh, as it pertains to sizing incidentally for implants, uh, the, the individual on the far right is a, is a great example of someone who um, I think to avoid revision surgery, um, exemplifies, and that's proper pre-education, proper pre-operative education. And when it comes to implants, I tell patients all the time, listen, you need to wait a good three months before you can make a final assessment on whether or not you like or hate the results. And uh, this individual, this very pretty woman on the right-hand side wanted cheek implants, and I told her, good chance you're going to come in back in around six weeks and say, I can't stand it, I want a revision, I want my cheek implants out, but I, I'm going to tell you right now, even before you do the surgery, wait a full three months and you'll see that you probably do not want those implants removed. And then sure enough, she came back at the three month mark and was thrilled and she loved it. She thought it was terrific. It's exactly what she wanted. Um, I'm a big believer in explaining as much as I can to patients beforehand so that they know what to expect during the procedure. At least they hear anything which may be just as valid after the procedure, but in hearing it after the procedure, they may think that it is more of an excuse, um, uh, uh, conjuring up some, some, um, um, some, 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 some uh, reason why it occurred, rather than knowing that it's an anticipated consequence of the procedure, and this is exactly how we're gonna handle it. Um, so it works with her, it works with uh, almost all implants, and, it works on implants that may not necessarily conform exactly to an individual's face because every face is different. And when you start getting a lot of facial asymmetry, well, you can, you can do something like a custom implant. And that works really well rather than requiring repeated, repeated treatments to the operating room. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Miller here. Sometimes patients ask me to go ahead and enhance their cheeks, their chin, their jaw. Every once in a while, there's such a massive asymmetry that I get asked to fix that asymmetry, not just enhance one aspect. And this was a really interesting case. It was a gentleman who had sort of a long chin on one side, a real, real short one on the other side. And the best way to treat that person was to create a customized implant. And we did this very interesting process of taking a three-dimensional CT scan and converting that into a scenario where we could put an implant on it and design it properly and have the patient approve it and then 3D print the implant, not only just for the chin itself, but for the jaw. 
And it's sort of cool because what's great about this one is most implants that go on, they sort of fit on top of the jaw, right? Either projecting the chin or making this go out a little bit more, the side. This patient, I needed to elongate. I needed to make it longer. So there was a special groove right in here that was created to fit underneath the jaw. And so it not only projected the chin, but it made this jaw area over here longer. Really cool case. Okay, we see another reason why you may want to get revision work, not because it didn't look necessarily good, not because you were unhappy, but simply because, well, aging. And as you get older, even if you've had work done on your eyes, um, the drooping and bags may come back. There may be asymmetry from scratching or from wiping your eye, one eye as opposed to another. As we age, our upper eyelid starts falling and starts covering our the black dot of our eyes are called the pupil, and that's called ptosis. Um, you can get weakening of the lower lid called an ectropion or an eversion or where it folds in. And that's from the uh, other surgery happening perhaps years later that needs to be corrected. So all of these reasons, including wanting perhaps better contour, can, can be reasons why patients who have previously had blepharoplasty are coming in and requesting more work in order to clean up that lower eyelid to make the, um, the lower lid less obvious, or again, because they've gotten a little older now and they want that excess skin, which had been removed before, to be removed again. Um, now, what is probably the best way to avoid any need for revision, right? What's the best surgical technique or what's the best innovation? And I think it gets back to what I said originally, right? It's all about communication. And for me, performing virtual surgical planning where I'm with the patient and I'm explaining to them what I think their results, uh, what I think they want for their results and being able to convey to them using enhanced computer imaging is absolutely critical. And uh, one thing that we've been using now for quite some time and I want to thank Clay, who's my patient coordinator. Ah, I, I don't know if I included Clay. That's right. So Clay, thank you. There you go. I, I knew I forgot a name. Um, uh, Clay has, has really adopted this extraordinarily well, and that's 3D imaging, uh, where we can take three-dimensional photographs of the patient, manipulate them, and in real time, have a communication with the patient. Uh, here's a great example. Uh, Jen, uh, yet another person I, I, I forgot to mention, Jen, I so hope you're not upset with me. Uh, Jen came in and um, uh, we used the Vectra 3D model. We were able to take her pictures, put it up on the computer. You can see that this is her imaging. And now we were able to make the modifications to the tip of her nose, to the bridge of her nose, even to the chin area. And um, we're doing this live in front of the patient. And you can see uh, an examination occurs right after that. And we can undergo a, an assessment uh, with the patient right there, uh, and they can give us their feedback and we can make modifications right there in front of us, in front of them. So they, they, they absolutely love that. I think that's probably the most important thing to avoid revision surgery is having a proper um, 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 uh, unified vision. That's what I call it, the unified vision and all of our natural look procedures, which is really just um, a, a, a term that I used, which emphasizes to my patients that I want to get natural results. I want to give them natural looking results that don't look artificial. Please, a little reminder, don't fall into trends on social media. Uh, don't do what suits others because um, it may not suit you. We will always be honest with you when you come in to see us. We will we'll tell you what we think benefits you and what you don't need. I see a lot of patients who get a lot of work and I tell them the next time you need something, come to me so I can tell you you don't need it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed some of these short videos that we or that I presented today. You can see all of those if you follow me on Instagram. I'm also TikTok. I have YouTube. Uh, I guess we're starting now, uh, April, on that new threads or something like that. And, and, and also X, or which was Twitter, and I can't follow all of these. But by all means, please, I, I do hope you follow us. And, um, and, and that, that way you know all of our new promotions that we're doing and all the different, um, uh, different new techniques that we're bringing into the practice. And if you've enjoyed tonight, please save the date. We are gonna be speaking once again on Tuesday, September 26th. And uh, the topic for that, I 
something is Ooh, it's, well, it's a good topic. Go ahead and tell me. I, yes, I thought, you're fat I and your blood turning back the clock with fat transfer and PRP with Nurse Jen. There you go. Nurse Jen will be will be. Uh, I thought I nailed everybody. I had my head. I went around and I basically was like, OK, I got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. And I and here I did. I forgot Clay and I forgot Jen. So I feel terrible. Please excuse me, you guys. I'm I'm terribly sorry. We love Jen. She's our amazing nurse injector and uh, laser. All right. So now we are open for questions. We are live. So any questions you may have, please pop them into the chat. And I see a couple already that we can get going on. So um, you spoke a lot about revision surgery, but can you also revise injectables? Ah. Uh. Yes. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. Now, some of the injectables are, they, while they may not be permanent, they're not reversible. Um, all of the neuromodulators, Botox, Daxify, uh, 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 Jubo, um, all of those neuromodulators that relax the muscle so that you aren't, um, you don't get wrinkles. Those are not reversible at all. So you just have to wait for three or four months. However, there may be results that you get, which, which aren't the best, but it often just means that you need a little bit more in different places and that can enhance or improve the, the, the result that you have. Um, as opposed to fillers, the fillers that you get, which um, are not dissolvable, ooh, guess what? You gotta wait. Oh, look at, am I zooming out? <laughs> you just Here. moved way back. I did, how did that happen? All right. That was cool. No worries. Well, while um, while he's repositioning himself, just a reminder to stay on because we're also going to pick the winners. And you can use the little chat feature in Zoom to send us any questions. That was cool. I like that. And I didn't even get I didn't even get dizzy when that happened. <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, yes, fillers. Um, I personally like using all the hyaluronic acid fillers because if for whatever reason the patients don't like it, I can dissolve it. So I love that. Got it. So um, is it true that revision surgery is more complicated than primary surgery? It, oh, as a general rule, I would say yes, but not necessarily. There are certain revisions which can be a lot easier. And not all revision surgery is, is again, is bad. Like I'll see a lot of noses or, or some faces or whatever, and I'll say, it's not like you need a revision, you need a completion. The, the doctor, it's not like the doctor didn't do it right. They just didn't do enough. And so I'm finishing the operation that, that should have or could have been done originally. And I'm just as guilty with that sometimes. I mean, you could argue that, and I tell this to patients, there's a maneuver in rhinoplasty called alar base reduction. And I tell them it is the one maneuver that is absolutely irreversible. And if I know that you need it, I will absolutely go ahead and uh, do it. But, but if I'm not sure that you need it, then because it is irreversible, I may not do it. I'm going to let it wait. And when you recover, the two of us will make that assessment. And if you need it, then I'll go ahead and do it after the surgery. Now, is that a revision? I don't know. Again, it's a completion. It's not necessarily revision. So, um, uh, um, uh, but I would rather, I, I, again, I work with a patient on that. Got it. Okay. So um, this is a really good question. Is it best to go back to the original surgeon for a revision because they've already been in there and they may know more, you know, about anatomy and what they did, or is it okay to go to a different surgeon? I get that question a lot. Um, I think, I think personally, it's best to go back to the original surgeon because you have a relationship with that surgeon and they have an, in, they have, they, they're invested or they should be invested in, in wanting to make you happy. But for whatever reason you went to them, there's a result which didn't satisfy. I always say the definition of a successful operation is a happy patient. It's not me looking at you going, you look terrific, right? So I, I want my patients to be happy and I want them coming back to me if they're dissatisfied because I want the opportunity to tell them and show them that I can fix it and that I can make it right. So I think it's more that that's the reason is that they're invested in making it look terrific. 
rather than going to somebody else who may only be interested in it because you're paying them a lot of money and that if it doesn't work out, they can go, hey, don't blame me. You had the surgery done by somebody else. The anatomy is the anatomy. Um, if you're a good revision surgeon, that shouldn't be an issue if someone else did the surgery or not. So I, 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 yeah, that's probably one of the first times I've ever um, vocalized it or verbalized it as such. <laughs> I really have, yeah. Thank you. It's it's really helpful to hear just your, the honest truth because I think that's always. Oh, I saw that someone was raising a hand. By the way, I, I, I know, know Kelly. Do you have a question? I chatted. I chatted. Oh, you did. Did you let her I know, that... Kelly? Yeah, pop it in the chat, okay. Kelly. If you have something. Um. Okay. So, a few more questions here. So, I want to avoid revisions. Oh, tell them how to do the chat because she may not know how to do the chat. Oh, she popped it in. I just got it. Oh, okay. Fine. Okay, perfect. So. So Kelly, so I have two grafts in my nose. The last one ruined the shape of my nose. Can these be removed or trimmed to get my smooth profile back? Without having seen you, uh, without, without knowing exactly what it is, um, I would say first, and uh, the, the reason I'm hesitating is that I, I often see patients who, who, are jumping to conclusions, meaning they think it's the graft that's causing the abnormality. So they want the graft out and they're already, cause they're very smart. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if you are that way, Kelly, it's cause you're really smart. When in fact, it's not the graft, that's not the issue. That's not the solution, blah, blah, blah. So I would just sort of say, if you're unhappy, by all means, come on in and let me take a look at it or go back to the surgeon and have them take a look at it. But don't be surprised if, if your gut is telling you that, the solution is X and you're hearing the solution is Y, trust your gut. I always say, trust your gut and then get another, get another recommendation from somebody else. But assuming that the graphs are related to that, absolutely. We can typically thin the graphs um, and replace them so that they can perform the function that they were intended to perform while not causing an aesthetic irregularity that you're clearly unhappy with. Mm, okay. And you can get a, your own consultation after this webinar so that Dr. Miller can examine you himself. All right. This is a, um, a great one. So this is from one of your patients, uh, Robert. He said, I just wanted to mention, I was one of those three to 5% showing Dr. Miller a ton of photos about what I didn't like and not the angles I liked about a plastectomy. He calmed me down and told me to wait and let things settle. And then he did a few tweaks. And in the end, the results were nine out of 10. So my advice is to listen to Dr. Miller. Don't panic in the first weeks, months, and in the end, you will see great results. Thank you. Oh, wow. What, that's a, such a nice, nice, that's such a nice, thank you. I, uh, that is great. I don't see the name up there. Maybe he left. I think you made I'll, it. I'll it, send it, it to you. Okay. I'll or send I'm it to you. But that was amazing. And um, Robert, we would love to see some updated pictures of you if you want to email the practice or share oh, with that's us. that's great. Thank We'd you. Love to thank see. you, Robert. Yeah. And thank that's, you for sharing because it's, yes. it's a really truthful, honest. Um, so what revision surgery of all the ones you talked about is the most common? And when would you turn someone away? I think the most common is going to be based on your practice. So I, I just happen to have very, I'm, I'm only facial plastics. And of that, I see primarily aging face and, and rhinoplasty. And it just so happens in my hands, I see, for whatever reason, I see tons of revision cases who, again, not from my hands. And, and so um, that, that's who I see the most in my practice. Um, and, I, and I turn away someone who, number one, I'm honest with myself and the patient. If I don't think I can achieve their results, um, if I think the results are unreasonable, I'll be very subtly, but I will convey to them, I think it's unreasonable. If I don't think I can get achieve their reasonable results, I'll just be honest and tell them I, I don't think that that's either possible or I don't think I can I, I can I can do that and and, um, and if I can't there are few who can but but you know I, uh, I I can probably come up with a couple of recommendations um, and then um, and and yeah th those are a couple of reasons why I would absolutely and I have turned down either revision or primary for that. That. Got it. Okay. So I think this may be our last question and then we can do our giveaway. So 
Um, this gentleman says, I want to avoid revision surgery, as do we all. So he said, what are the main reasons why someone would come back? I think the main reason, as I've uh, sort of mentioned a number of times, is that your results that you wanted were not achieved. And the question has to be raised, were they not achieved because they were unachievable? So arguably, you never should have had the surgery in the first place, and the surgeon should have told you that. Um, or were they not achieved because they can be achieved and either the improper technique was used, not the ideal technique was used, the healing wasn't uh, in the ideal situation. The, 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 I hate to say it, but sort of the lower expectations you have, the happier you're gonna be and the less of a need for revision work, the higher the expectations, the more likely that you're going to wanna to have revision because Look, this isn't a perfect science. This is still somewhat of an art. We're not dealing with wood and, and, and stone and steel. We're dealing with soft tissue and cartilage and bone and ligaments. And they don't respond how we always want them to respond. Um, uh, not all tissue heals the exact same way. We know so much more now than we did just 10 years ago, but we are still at this stage doing retrospective studies and seeing how different skin types uh, respond to different techniques. And we try to modify our techniques moving forward based on that. One of the interesting things that I will point out, and we haven't done our study yet, but we're asking patients now, how many hours a day do you think about your appearance? And we are now gonna compare that with the number of patients who come back in requesting revision. So we hopefully will be able to tell you soon whether or not you have a high or a low chance of wanting a revision. And it may not necessarily be that specific criteria that we find, but we are trying to find out if we can anticipate those patients who, um, no matter how great the result, uh, want, want to have revision surgery. That's really interesting. I love that. You're always researching and studying and figuring out the next thing. And I'm sure you will publish it once you have it. That's amazing I to hear. So. All right. So um, we will let everyone get a little bit back to their evening early tonight, but let's pick the winners first. Oh, nice. All right. All so right. Thank, thank you again for tuning in. I know that this, you know, certainly if you're here and you've had surgery, you know, we feel for you. We know what it's like. We have lots of patients coming in that are unhappy. Um, but the good news is, you know, you came to the right place and Dr. Miller is definitely a great choice to at least speak with and get his opinion before you're going to proceed with any revision surgery. So um, with our winners, as a reminder, everyone here gets a complimentary consultation. So that's a $400 value, and that can be virtual in person in New York or in person in New Orleans. And furthermore, uh, three lucky attendees are going to get $500 credited towards their surgery. And those people are... KM for the initials and oh I see there's two KMs um uh Kelly M <laughs> Kelly M and uh CW and RL so didn't want to say anyone's name just for HIPAA, you know, confidentiality, but we will reach out tomorrow to let you guys know. And all of you are winners because you came here, you learned more and it's, you know, educating yourself is definitely the first step to make sure you're going to be successful. And if you guys take away anything from this webinar, I think how Dr. Miller explained about being on the same page with the patients, that is so important because we see other surgeons that think they did a great job, but they have a different idea about what a beautiful nose looks like than, than you might. So it's so important that you're aligned and that's really what is a huge differentiator that sets Dr. Miller apart. So thank you, Dr. Miller, for your time. Thanks I know you had a busy again. day. Thank you. thank you, thank you. You're always so amazing on these webinars and I get more compliments. I get patients who are coming in who didn't have an opportunity to watch the, uh, watch the webinar live, but who saw it on our YouTube or saw it on our um, yes. Instagram or social media, and they're like, oh my God, and she was great. Who is she? She's fabulous. And I said, her name is Risa. And 
She's not. Thank you so much. I've been partnering with Dr. Miller for many years now to support his practice, normally on the behind the scenes, but yes. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, get some good sleep and we hope to see you all following us on social media and coming in for your consultation so we can meet you. Look forward to seeing you soon, y'all. Take care. Bye.